Welcome viewers to the Inside Interviews podcast, which we hope is an enlightening series of academic discussions taking a deeper dive on a variety of unique topics. After this episode, be sure to check out the previous ones on our website, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Today, we are pleased to have Dr. Richard McCallum with us. He's the director of the Center for Muslim Christian Studies at Oxford. Richard McCallum is also an associate member of the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of Oxford and a stipendiary tutor at Wycliffe Hall. His research interests lie in the contemporary encounter of Christians and Muslims in society, especially in the UK. Within the framework of the sociology of religion, that is, his most recent book is Evangelical Christian Responses to Islam, a contemporary overview published by Bloomsbury in 2024. I personally find this book um, to be fascinating. It couldn't be more relevant to what is going on today in our uh, contemporary world. Thank you, Dr. McCallum, for joining us today. That's a pleasure. Good to be with you. The book that you that you wrote about um, is is this has always been a subject of, of of my own fascination, which is it's not so much um, always you know like Christian Muslim dialogue is interesting, but evangelicals are are particularly interesting, and they are a unique group, an interesting group. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about who the evangelicals are? Who are they? And kind of how did you arrive at writing this book? Sure. Uh, well, evangelical Christians uh, covers a very, very wide range of uh, different uh, denominations, traditions. And it's really quite a contested term. Uh, probably just in its most simple level, you could say that Evangelical Christians are a Bible believing Christians who believe that Jesus Christ is in some way unique. Um, now, there, there are sort of some technical definitions. Uh, they are uh, voluntarists, meaning they would say that you can't just be born into the faith. You actually have to choose to join the faith, uh, sometimes called crucicentric, uh, which means that they, they put the cross, uh, the cross of Jesus and salvation right at the center of faith. And as the name suggests, they're also engaged in evangelism. They, they want to preach the good news. They want to pass it on to, to other people. But I mean, having said that, there are no sort of clear uh, delimitating uh, barriers around the evangelical community. And there's a lot of dispute about it. Some people um, don't want to be called evangelicals uh, because they, they feel that has a, now has a negative association, particularly in the United States, where Evangelical Christians are often associated with right wing supporters of, well, at the moment, Trump. Um, and so particularly in this country, there would be quite a lot of evangelicals that would say, well, well, well we're not really, maybe we wouldn't use the word evangelical. We're Bible believing Christians or, or they would choose some other uh, phrase. And sociologists have also um, wondered whether the, the, the label evangelical is really so useful anymore, be, just because it covers such a wide range of of different Christians. Um, so it would include very conservative uh, North American Christians, but it also could include um, black African Pentecostals. Uh, and really, the, in some ways, those two have very little in common, uh, except that they are both Bible believing and they both believe that Jesus is unique and they probably both want to engage in evangelism. But otherwise, their politics, their view of other faiths and so on would be very different. So it's a very broad um, term. Would it be similar to charismatic Christianity? Um, as well. Yeah. I don't know if that yeah. is connected. Um, charismatic is probably best viewed as a subset of evangelical. So um, both evangelicals and charismatics can cross all of the denominational boundaries. So um, you can have evangelical Baptists and Anglican Baptists, Presbyterian and so on. Um, you can have... Uh, evangelical charismatic, um, sorry, Anglican charismatics and Baptist charismatics and 
um, and Presbyterian charismatics and so on. So they, they both cross all those denominational boundaries. But uh, there would be some evangelicals who would definitely not want to be called charismatic, uh, sort of for some technical reasons, but also experiential reasons. Charismatics are uh, would say that they're experiencing the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Their worship is often a lot more expressive. Uh, a conservative evangelical uh, would maybe feel that wasn't appropriate today and couldn't be justified from Scripture and, and so on. So. I, I would always see charismatic as a subset. I, I would say that probably all charismatics are, in fact, evangelicals, but not not vice versa. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you arrived at writing this book? Um, we, I always like to to understand an author's journey. It clearly mm -hmm. is it's a it's a significant book. It's what two hundred, it's almost three hundred pages in its fine in the print edition here that I have. So clearly, it was a significant amount of writing and a significant amount of work. How did you arrive at it? What was your journey to this book? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, I grew up in the evangelical church. Uh, it's if you like my community and my background. Um, I spent uh, 10 years uh, living and teaching uh, in the Arab world. I was in Tunis in North Africa. I was teaching in the university there. So I had all my colleagues and neighbours were, uh, were Muslims. I, when I left uh, the UK, nobody was particularly interested in Islam. Uh, this was the 90s. Um, it's, it was sort of very far away. I returned to the UK in 2002, uh, which is, of course, the year after 9-11 and discovered that everybody suddenly wanted to know about Islam. Everybody was asking, who are these Muslims? Why, you know, why are they attacking us and so on? So because I'd spent time overseas, I was invited to all sorts of churches and conferences to, to speak. And I was also listening to other uh, Christians who were speaking on that topic. And I was aware uh, that there was a really wide range of approaches and responses, uh, some of which I felt were really unhelpful and, and even quite dangerous. Um, so um, I, that wasn't my academic background, uh, but I decided that because of my own engagement um, in the topic, that I wanted to do some more research. Uh, so that was when I uh, started my doctoral studies. Um, I studied at the University of Exeter with a sociologist, uh, a very eminent sociologist called uh, Professor Grace Davey, and uh, looked at Christian responses to Islam in Britain. So my doctoral work um to maybe 20 years ago was um was um very much focused on this country uh the more recent book that i've written is uh, much more of a global overview but it, it was really out of concern for for how christians and particularly christians in positions of influence were were teaching and talking about islam and muslims certainly it, it is something that we, re we, we see on the news almost every single day, people citing Christianity or citing, I mean, what I mean by on the news, I mean, in the sense, the Western news media, Western politicians, especially in the United States. Um, so clearly it is something extremely important. Um, and, 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 and this is what kind of brings us to Habermas. Uh, you, you, you mentioned him at the beginning as a, you, you know, you can obviously describe it for yourself, but kind of framing some of your um, your discussion around his theory of um, of the public sphere mm. um, and the role of religion, if any, that it should or does play within that public sphere. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, Christianity. And then the role that it plays vis-a-vis -vis Islam within that within that sphere. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you chose Habermas and yeah. uh, how it kind of anchors the the discussion going forward in the book? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mentioned that when I started my doctoral work, I didn't particularly have a sociological background. So uh, my initial working title for my doctorate was something like Christian Responses to Islam in Britain. Um, but uh, I kind of felt that lacked a certain gravitas. Uh, so I tacked on the end uh, in the public sphere, sort of meaning in public, uh, you know, in the public space. 
And then I started to do a bit of reading and decided to look in some indexes about this phrase, public sphere, and discovered it's, it's for sociologists, it's a whole big topic. Um, it, it doesn't just mean the public square or in public. It actually has a, sort of a more specific meaning, and it's to do with uh, the formation of uh, what we call public opinion. And one of the names that just kept on cropping up was Jürgen Habermas. Um, this this very well known uh, German sociologist philosopher, and as I started to look at his work, um, I just really felt that it kind of like captured what I saw going on in evangelical communities, and particularly, and it's maybe just because I like coffee, but he has this idea of um, in the early 18th century, uh, these groups develop in in the new coffee shops in London and Paris and and so on. Um, they're quite elite groups because you had to be quite elite to be able to afford to drink coffee in those days. But um, there, there's a lot, apparently, a lot of these coffee shops beginning to open at that time. And so groups would gather and they would begin to talk about things that they were concerned about, um, things in public life. And uh, out of that, they began to develop newsletters and they're circulating newsletters uh, and they're beginning to take on um reasoned opinions that they went, then want to promote uh to what well, maybe to government or certainly to wider society they're actually wanting to to influence things and so as i was reading about this actually this is kind of like what happens uh amongst christians including amongst evangelicals we uh, get together in our little groups um Christians, like everybody else, like to drink coffee, so it sometimes happens in coffee shops, but um, it often happens in seminars, conferences, and, of course, then in the circulation of texts as well, which uh, very much becomes part of Habermas's theory of how public opinion is generated, because out of these early discussion groups in, in coffee shops in Europe, he traces the development of newspapers, um, things like the in the British context, the Spectator, the Guardian, uh, so well-known titles, um, and and of course out of uh, the discussions that evangelicals have together around lots of different topics, but including Islam, uh, they then begin to uh, write in magazines, uh, write of course nowadays on websites, in blogs, uh, and also publish books, and they they read each other's writing and then very often respond to it, uh, criticizing it, agreeing with it, amplifying it, and so on. And so it just seemed to be a very good description of, of how discourse is generated uh, within any community, uh, particularly the evangelical community. Now, I mean, people always um, complain and say, well, why didn't you use Bourdieu and his habitus? Or, you know, was, yeah, there are other theorists out there. Why, why have them? But I mean, really, it was because of the coffee shops. I mean, that, it just, it won my heart. I mean, it's just like... Yeah. 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 And, and, and this is where these these discourses are occurring or constructed. Would you say this is something along the lines of civil society? Mm -hmm. society? Yeah. Uh, well, it's certainly the the public sphere is is cited in uh, in civil society. Um, so it, it's it's not part of state life. Um, it is it's specifically not governed by by state. So um, it's very much uh, cited in civil society. Civil society, of course, is is bigger. And this is something very much centered on on discourse uh, and on this circulation of, of text. Civil society is wider than that. But yeah. Excellent. Um, right off the bat, you uh, again, one of the things I just love about the book is is how clearly it is written. It's not gouged in so much um, technical language. Of course, it's you know it is, is is naturally an academic book, but you very in a very straightforward manner you you, you describe Islam as being viewed by two poles, and I found this quite concerning. Not not the fact that you wrote it, but the fact that that mm. you know this, this observation exists confrontational and conciliatory. Um, can you shed some more light of this? The, essentially, there are these two poles, and it's almost runs throughout your book. There's a confrontational mm -hmm. approach and um, and a more friendly approach or conciliatory approach. Yeah. Uh, 
can you shed a little little bit of light on this in the context of, of your research and kind of how this plays out? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, pretty much it's what I immediately saw even before I started doing my, my research. It's what I experienced when I was listening to different uh, Christians speaking on the topic. And it just becomes very obvious that some are extremely concerned about Islam. They see Muslims as um, maybe the enemy within or, or people coming in uh, to take over with an agenda. And so there's a lot of fear. Um, and then others who would be, these, these people are our neighbors. We have to reach out. We have to build relationships. We have to love them. We have to live together well. Um, and so it, it just very quickly becomes obvious. And then as I began to read around it, um, I mean, this my observations are not unique. Others uh, had already observed this. So even the terms um, conciliatory and, and confrontation, which she came from another academic, Clinton Bennett, he'd already written on them. Um, somebody else calls them uh, antagonistic and friendly. Uh, you know, so a lot of people have noticed this. Um, but of course, it's always important to know that these are actually uh, types. I mean, sociology deals in types. Uh, and a dyad like this are really the poles at two ends of a spectrum. Um, and so there would be plenty of people that wouldn't be entirely confrontational. They wouldn't be entirely conciliatory. So there would be some maybe who would have uh, you know, questions or concerns about some aspects, um, but we would very much want to engage with Muslims and so on. So um, almost like blending uh, the two positions. So um, it's not it's not quite as black and white, of course, as um, it, it sounds when you begin writing about it. But I, I think it's just eminently observable. And when you look at the discourse about Islam amongst Christians in any country, not just Britain, you know, it quite quickly becomes evident that there are those who are just much more relaxed um, about the whole issue and others that are a lot more antsy about it. And, and on that same note, in between the conciliatory and confrontational approaches, Islamophobia is clearly a problem today. Um, in Canada, I don't know, but the UK can correct. Uh, you can um, you can shed some more light on that. In Canada, we actually have, uh, um, a, I wouldn't say a minister, but someone at the federal level who's in charge of dealing with Islamophobia. As you uh, may be aware, a few years back, there was a mass murder of Muslims. Actually, there have been multiple mass murders of Muslims now, and now in 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 Canada, in Quebec, and in Ontario, there was a a family murdered in cold blood, uh, just two hours from here, for being Muslim. It was an Islamophobic uh, murder terrorist act, and then there was um, a group of uh, worshippers uh, gunned down uh, in prayer in Quebec City, just about six hours from here. Now, you think Canada is such an amazing, you know, the place of peace where we all get along and we always say sorry. But interest, you know, sadly enough, um, Islamophobia is something very real. Um, and it's something that has really affected the community here in Canada. And as I'm sure it has all other parts of the world, I'm a Canadian myself. So, um, but this concept is also controversial among evangelicals, isn't it? As you point out, and I think this is this is such an extremely important point that you bring up, which again kind of puts us between the conciliatory and the confrontational approaches mm -hmm. um, on the issue of Islamophobia or the hatred of Muslims or um, you know the kind of um, yeah hatred of of Muslims for being Muslim, shall we say, or so. Can you tell us a little bit about how you dealt with that in your book um, and where the evangelicals sit? Again, they don't sit in one place. There's different perspectives. And I really appreciate that you do provide that that spectrum. And I think my listeners would, would really like to, to learn about that. Mm, sure. So um, in Britain, the term of Islamophobia really sort of comes more into um public discourse in the 90s with the publication of uh, a report by the Runnymede Trust. Uh, and they define Islamophobia as uh, fear or dread of Islam. But they, they go on to say that um, sort of debate or questioning about Islam is completely valid, that you know to discuss Islam is, is not to be forbidden, but it's this uh, 
fear and dread that leads to hatred that uh, is the problem. And, and I, I think a lot of Christians uh, would just be comfortable with that, including evangelicals. They're like, yeah, obviously you shouldn't be uh, afraid and hate people. I think for um, some evangelicals, the problem comes when they feel, uh, and they, they would cite particular instances, when uh, the whole concept of Islamophobia is used not just to combat, uh, for instance, uh, anti-Muslim attacks and so on, but also any questioning or discuss discussion about Islam, about the history of Islam, the texts of Islam, and so on. Uh, and so they would uh, fear that there's actually a hidden agenda, either by Muslims or, or indeed by sort of liberal governments, to, to shut down any criticism or uh, questioning or uh, critiquing of Islam itself. So um, there, are, there are some uh, Christians, evangelicals, who are very concerned whenever they hear about new definitions of Islamophobia. And uh, in this country, um, just uh, in the last few years, there's been a new definition by an all-party parliamentary group um, and I should say at this point that uh, Britain is different in as much we don't we don't have a minister in charge of Islamophobia or um, or even in charge of you know Muslim communities or anything like that. Um, matter of fact, the the previous government, the Conservative government, uh, did have uh, a Muslim advisor on um, Islamophobia, and they never actually talked to him at all. In the end, he resigned. Um, so I mean, the whole thing was a bit of a fiasco, to be honest. I mean, he, I, I know him; he's a lovely guy, uh, but they just didn't engage with him. So uh, you know, why appoint him in the first place? Anyway, that's that's a whole other question. But anyway, the um, the all party parliamentary group uh, published a definition of Islamophobia, uh, which wasn't unique to them, but it it describes Islamophobia as a type of racism. And uh, because of that, there are all sorts of people that then uh, jumped on this, uh, evangelicals and indeed others, uh, civil libertarians and so on, who said, hold on, like Muslims aren't a race, it's, it's a religion. Um, and so you can have uh, Arabs who are Christians, you know, so, you know it's, not a, it's not a racial thing. So um, they, they basically managed to sort of trash the definition in their own eyes uh, sort of based on the fact that it was it was posited around racism. Now, I, personally, I think this was sort of a bit of a tragedy because it's sort of a bit of an own goal, really. Um, the what we need in a definition of Islamophobia is to protect uh, the Muslim community from the sorts of attacks that you're talking about. Uh, and in this country, we haven't had, uh, thankfully, mass attacks uh, like that on Muslims, but we have had plenty of. Uh, more isolated attacks, individual um, attacks, including some murders, uh, sadly. Um, and it's it's those sorts of things that I think all Christians, evangelical in other words, should agree that we need to be protecting people from. Nobody wants to see uh, individuals or even uh, communities being targeted in that way. So however we define Islamophobia, uh, it must be clear that its role is or the the aim of that definition is to protect people to protect communities um, and as long as we keep giving people a bit of an out by saying ah no it's not a race you know we you've used the race word not accepting it that's kind of like giving people a, an easy out um so i mean I, I i do think we need a better uh, definition of islamophobia that is more focused uh, on people themselves. And, th and there are good definitions out there. And I, I, I mentioned some of those in the book. Um, but yeah, it is, it is, it has been a controversial issue uh, amongst evangelicals who suspect some sort of conspiracy uh, to silence people, basically. Yeah, I, I, in, and I completely agree with the point that Islamophobia should certainly not be used as a means of stifling academic research, stifling people, or even declaring their opinion about anything. I mean, I think that, again, these things are, they're full of gray areas at times, right? Because, um, you know, I mean, this, this could be used to, you know, for, for any any group um, ultimately um, and, and and end up stifling, um, you know, academic research or people who 
let's say want to research the life of the prophet and they may come to conclusions and you do discuss that in your book at length uh conclusions that muslims that traditional uh, believing muslims may not necessarily agree with that's no. not islamophobia of course right mm -hmm. that's that's academic research um and i think sometimes and here i'm just opining but i think that sometimes the laws cannot police these things i think it's just about common decency um, and just just understanding, you know, do unto others as you wish to be done unto you. You know, I mean, there, there's a difference between critique and hate, hate mm -hmm. feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Those are those are two two different things um, of like of an entire community because of their um, their their they're just based on their identity, simply yeah. put, right? Not based on that particular person doing something that is worthy of of dislike. Yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, it, it's a very difficult line to judge between critique and engendering hatred and and the law um, or the legal process is that has a lot of difficulty um, sort of discerning the difference. Uh, so one of the instances I cite in my book was uh, happened in Australia where there was um, a, an evangelical who was actually a convert from Islam, um, calls himself Daniel Scott. And He'd been teaching, and it, uh, I, I mean, I don't know exactly what he was teaching, but he said he was just using uh, the Islamic sources to talk about the life of Muhammad, and of course, mentioning his wives and wars, and you know, and so on. And then there was uh, a Muslim group; uh, it was actually in the state of Victoria that that took him to court and said this is engendering hatred, um, and they won their case to begin with at the first court. Uh, however, he took it on to a higher court, and then the uh, the finding was overturned eventually because they said, "Well, no, he is actually just uh, citing Islamic sources." But um, when does citing Islamic sources when's that done in such a way that it's engendering hatred? I mean, it's a very difficult uh, point to to prove. Um, so it, I agree with you, but it's not quite so easy. It's not. It's full of gray areas, and and I think that. Um... This is where lawyers, ethicists, philosophers, scholars of sociology of religion, such as yourself and others can, this is where coffee shops can be quite useful to have these conversations yeah. and people can, these things have to be deliberated and discussed. And I think if just simply left to politicians, I don't think they, they understand the nuances of many of these things on either side, whether it be on, on just, you know, on, you know, on, supporting anti-Islamophobia, anti-Islamophobia, you know, things, or whether on the other side of saying, well, there shouldn't be any anti-Islamophobia, you know, um, uh, support or, you know, uh, governmental, um, you know, intervention. Uh, so, but again, I, and I want to, I wanted to, I really just wanted to ask you, the UK and the US are very different places, the two sides of the ocean, let us say, right, that both sides of the Atlantic are very different when it comes to evangelicals in some ways. And you point that out numerous times in your book. And I really appreciate how you clearly point out that, look, that there are different spectrums. Um, and they're also different, obviously, geographically very different, and politically very different. They fall on both the left and the right of the political spectrum. Could you describe for us very briefly, I think most people know what right-wing evangelicalism looks like. I mean, I think mm. just CNN or Fox News, and you're gonna get an idea kind of of what that, that looks like, but for the, uh, in, in America, in the American context at least, but at least for, for, for our listeners, um, can you kind of describe how the evangelical community can be both found on the left and the right. I found this to be very interesting that they can also be found on the left. Yeah, sure. Well, in in the United States, in particular, yes, you do have a very large body of right wing evangelicals, very vocal, and uh, in a sense, they're the ones the media focus on because they're so vocal and because they're a good news story. But um, even just this week, a colleague of mine was um, looking up. Uh, another academic, actually, who said he was working in some project in Texas. And he said to me, wow, this guy, he's, he works with a church and they're just doing such good social stuff, uh, caring for asylum seekers and stuff. Why don't we ever hear that in in the media? And so, of course, in the U.S., you do get a lot of uh, evangelicals who are doing great stuff, 
building bridges and communities, welcoming asylum seekers and so on. Um, they, they often do have more left-leaning politics. Um, so I think we would normally associate US evangelicals with voting Republican. And there are plenty of um, uh, American evangelicals I've come across who just feel like to vote Democrat would be to vote for the devil himself. You know, they just couldn't ever, you know, whoever is standing as a Republican has just got to be better than a Democrat. You just can't do it. But uh, there are other evangelicals in the U.S. who who do vote Democrat, obviously. And uh, I, I cite a lot of them in, in the book. Uh, and there are people who are concerned with social issues often. Um, people like John, Jim Wallace, who's uh, yeah. written a lot about um, uh, the American sort of support for war, um, the single issue um, of, you know, abortion, which is often so important to uh, evangelicals and so on. And he's, he's been very critical of those sorts of things. And he's also been very open to Muslims. Um, Tony Campolo would uh, be another Shane Claiborne and so on. In, in the UK, um, Christians tend to be a lot less political. Um, it's a different sort of voting system and, and uh, political party system. You don't have to register as a, a conservative voter or a Labour uh, voter. Uh, in actual fact, uh, party membership is sort of an all-time loan. It's really, really small. So not many people at all in the general population belong to a political party. But um, it would be much more even spread uh, across the party uh, political parties, if you interview Christians in general, Church of England or evangelicals, whatever measure you take, uh, you will find conservatives, uh, Labour supporters and Liberal Democrats as well. And it's sort of pretty even uh, across across the parties. So uh, there's much less of a, a party political vote uh, amongst evangelicals. Having said that, um, we are seeing some of the same sorts of uh, trends that you do see in North America. Um, so there is an increasing uh, evangelical Christian voice that is quite nationalist, uh, sort of a, a, a wanting to espouse a Christian na Christian nationalism. Um, they, you know, they look to a, a bygone day of what they might call Christendom, or uh, certainly a time when our laws were more influenced by uh, Christian thought and morals. Uh, and they kind of want to go back. Now, whether they, those days ever existed is debatable. Um, and other Christians wouldn't want to go back there anyway for all sorts of reasons. Um, but there, there certainly is sort of a, a, a lively debate now in this country. Uh, and again, we are seeing sort of more influence of this sort of spectrum again. Uh, those who would be more right wing and then uh, those who would be very concerned about that who would want uh, want to counter it. And of course, the two push each other uh, apart. It's kind of nostalgic nativism. Mm, yeah. Right? And um, yeah, the interesting thing that, you know, as I was reading the book and just thinking about the broader issues is that Muslims tend to have a lot in common with evangelical Christians in terms of family values, um, certain social values, um, their definition of life, there's a lot more they can agree on than disagree. Mm -hmm. A lot more, I think. Um, your average devout Muslim, uh, Sunni or Shia, uh, could probably agree on a lot more than they could disagree, minus obviously certain theological issues, clearly. But uh, yet... They, um, you know, at least the media seems to present it as if they're in this intractable state of conflict, right? You um, and and uh, it's just I don't know if do do some evangelicals discuss that that hey wait a second you know what we have could have a lot in common with the Muslim community in terms of the values that they espouse um, on the issues that I just mentioned to you, to name mm -hmm. a few, as mm -hmm. opposed to making them, you know, uh, you know, uh, this, the boogeyman, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, there would be evangelicals, I cite them in the book, yeah. um, who, who have said things like, 
you know, maybe uh, God in his sovereignty has brought, brought Muslims to the West at this time uh, to help uh, Christians and others counter an in increasing secularism uh, and materialism and decline in morals. Um, so, yes, you know, maybe uh, there's a common cause. Um, you know, may maybe this is something to the Christian advantage. So there are there are certainly um uh, evangelicals who would uh, maybe think in that way. I mean, I, I would say the, um, I mean, and the big points are difference. One is, as you say, it's theological. And because part of the definition of being evangelical is this um, centeredness on the Bible and also on the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. And because those are, are two things that Islam sort of challenges off the bat, uh, the Bible's being changed. Uh, Jesus was uh, in no way divine, not the Son of God. He was just a, a human prophet. I mean, so, I mean, right there uh, in the centre of what the evangelicals would say is the most important thing to them, you, you find this um, discord. Um, but, I mean, you can still agree to differ theologically and say, but we need to live together. So the, the other big concern that uh, a lot of evangelicals have and would voice is, uh, and it's not unique to them, but is this idea of um, Muslims encroaching, coming into the West, uh, beginning to become more powerful, and then this process of what they call creeping Islamization. Um, and so uh, they would look at Islam and say, well, actually, Islam is historically been a political religion. Um, it is, no, I mean, Christianity has uh, been implicated in power and in politics in the past and the whole colonial era. But a lot of Christians and particularly a lot of evangelicals would say, but actually that was an abnormality. Uh, the church should never have gone there. Um, the example of Jesus and so on, humility, um, Jesus refusing to take up earthly power, etc. Uh, a lot of evangelicals would say, we, we don't want to go back there. But then they look at Islam and say, but in actual fact, Islam seems to have some sort of uh, will to power. You mentioned Kenneth Cragg. That was a phrase that he used, the will to power. Um, and if they're uh, moving into the West and if they're beginning to demand more rights, demand more uh, in get involvement in um, community and then politics, uh, and so inevitably in power, surely that's a danger to us. Um, and they, they're going to be uh, sort of pushing us out. And, uh, I quote a little story that uh, one evangelical, American evangelical, uh, tells um, an anecdote about uh, the camel who begins to poke his, his nose in through the tent. Uh, and every night he, he pokes his nose in a little bit further and the guy in the tent lets him come in a bit further and a bit further. You know, and then in the end, of course, you discover that the, the camel's in the tent and, and you're outside. Uh, and so it would be that sort of concern. So... There's the theological, but then I think there's also this other uh, concern, which is about uh, political power. Um, and and then, of course, that's then linked to demographics and you get all sorts of alarmist um, predictions and extrapolations of, of how Muslim communities, particularly in Europe, uh, are growing. I mean, not so much in America at this stage, but um, you know, there, there are places in Europe where the percentage of Muslims is in, increasing quite markedly. Um, and so then that becomes a very easy uh, tool for evangelicals to use to, to stoke further fear um, about you know, what might lie in the future. Yeah, and, and which you do mention on page 40. I, I, I wanted to get to this. Um... I, I love that you know your book, my, my book, better than I do. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I highlighted it and have marks everywhere. Yes, I, I really enjoyed it. I might even write it, write a review, I think, um, if I get a chance Please, to. Yeah. Um, where was this on page 40? Yes, you're speaking about the social context where you said, the first decades of the 21st century have certainly seen big changes in the context in which Christians and Muslims encounter one another. The Middle East has become a war zone between Western armies and groups branded as Muslim terrorists with local Christian Muslim relationships often as collateral damage. The economic and cultural influence of Wahhabi Islam in Africa and Asia has upset settled patterns of historical friendship. 
Demographic growth, migration, and the impact of climate change have turned parts of West and East Africa into flashpoints of violence between Muslim and Christian communities competing for power, land, and resources. Moreover, the rise of populist nationalism in many European and American countries has fueled fear, xenophobia, and anti-Muslim sentiments. That's a lot going on in the world, isn't there? You yeah. sum it up in a few sentences. Yeah. Well, and you know, you, you go back uh, some centuries, and Christians and Muslims, and particularly Western Christians, had very little contact with each other. So, yeah, I mean, you might fight wars, you, and they're the bogeyman over there, but there's no. Now, the, the story of the church in the East, and particularly the Middle East, of course, is very different. And for for centuries, uh, Middle Eastern Christians have lived alongside Arab Muslims um, and have reached some sort of settled pat pattern. Um, I wouldn't have said it's always been uh, problem free, but it's sort of another story. Moving into the, the 20th century, um, the, the world obviously begins uh, to change. But even at the end of the 20th century, as, as I said uh, earlier, um, you know, nobody was that interested in Islam and Muslims. It wasn't on the news every day. It, and when it was, it was it was very far away. Um, you know, Iranian Revolution. Um, then the uh, Lebanon civil war, maybe, you know, um, and, and of course the Israel-Palestine conflict, although originally that, that really didn't have an element of, uh, of Islam about it. It was, it was Arabs and Jews um, rather than um, religious conflict. But I, as soon as you get into the 21st century, and I, I, I do think 9-11 was sort of quite a turning point, um, suddenly... Um, Muslims are in the news, but more than that, the uh, upheavals that are happening sort of because of 9-11, so the Gulf Wars, I mean, we'd had the first Gulf War, but I mean, that didn't cause the same sort of uh, repercussions, mainly because um, the Western forces didn't actually enter Iraq. Um, but in the second Gulf War, they did. Uh, you get the conflict in Afghanistan. And then this just begins to set up a whole um movement of people where you know refugees are beginning to flow everywhere you've also got a, a, a great increase in anti-western sentiments um, and then that results in islamic extremism at the same time you're getting uh, the beginnings of the effects of the uh, global climate crisis uh, and so that's what's setting other people in motion maybe in the sahel in west africa um with the fulani coming further south that brings them into conflict with uh, settled communities, which historically tended to be Christian communities. So you, you're beginning to get conflicts there. So there are sort of some big global dynamics that are producing movement of peoples and particularly uh, bringing Muslims in into the West, either because they're moving for economic reasons, which was the original post-war um, factor in, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, but then continuing today with this you know, huge um, economic inequity uh, between the, the West and other places, but then because of climate and then particularly because of war. Uh, and so once you get people, uh, a lot of people moving in to a country, and I mean, this is, we've just seen this in the American election, that it's been a huge topic of discussion, uh, immigration and so on. Um, then you look at, well, who are those immigrants? Oh, they're, and then they are predominantly uh, certainly in Britain and in most of the rest of Europe, they are from Muslim backgrounds. Um, I think the last um, statistic I saw quoted was something like 60% of the world's refugees are Muslims, um, which is is either uh, a factor, a motivating factor for compassion and for you know aid and development to flow, or uh, it inspires fear and the, and then because of that hatred. So, yeah, I mean, I think there are some very big uh, global movements that have conspired to uh, bring it right down again to Christians and Muslims and particularly evangelicals and Muslims, just to bring it right into, into focus and in, in the, into the agenda in a way that before the turn of the millennium, it, it just wasn't an issue. Which elicits both conciliatory and confrontational approaches. Absolutely. And there are, there are many, many evangelicals who are really, really concerned uh, for Muslims. 
So, I mean, in actual fact, if you look at in this country, uh, you know, who are the groups that are um, staffing asylum welcome and, you know, some of these other groups, it's very often evangelical Christians who are actually there on the ground caring for people. I and mean, that's really common. Um, and then there are other evangelicals, of course, who are at a distance and they might even be in the crowd that are attacking a, a refugee asylum centre uh, because they have these sort of uh, right wing nationalist tendencies and, and fears. Uh, so, again, there you, you can very clearly see this, the spectrum and the, and the tension between the conciliation and the confrontation. And I think a lot of this also boils down to what is Western liberalism? And who does it include and who does it leave out? The Western liberal project, right? Mm. Uh, Post-Renaissance Western liberal project um, or the secular age, right? It cuts both ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and this is what Taylor says in the secular age and others. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because the right to believe, the right to not believe, the right to be, the right to not be anything, right? This is this whole notion of, of um, the public sphere as, as inhabiting and accommodating a gamut of, you know, a whole spectrum of ideologies or a kind of open-ended relativism to some extent um, is what essentially accommodates for Muslims or any, people of any faith to exist within the context of, of, of the modern secular nation state. Mm -hmm. um, how do evangelicals engage with this? With the, the, at one point, you know, the freedom of religion, the freedom of, of, um, of speech, which are very um, sacred things, especially in the United States, on the one hand, but on the other hand saying, well, we're going to limit that because that should be Christian or it should be like this or like that. Muslims should not be included within that. So thus they should not have a right to dress in their Islamic clothing or the call to prayer or women should not have a right to walk um, in public with their uh, hijab on because that's offensive. You're bringing something, you know. How do some even, and again, there's a gamut of approaches to this, mm -hmm. right? Because on one mm -hmm. hand, you're, you know, it, it's the very structure of Western liberalism or Western, the modern nation state, the modern secular nation state in the Western hemisphere that allows for this to occur. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword, so to speak, or two, two, it's a two-sided coin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh so, I mean, the first thing I would say is I think, I mean, all evangelicals are very concerned about uh, freedom, uh, not so much of speech, but freedom of religion, freedom of religion or con conscience and belief. Uh, and um, in that instance, uh, their particular concern points towards uh, Muslim majority contexts or just Muslim contexts in general, where they feel that there's a lack of freedom, uh, both for Christians to practice their faith and particularly uh, in places where there is Sharia law uh, in some way operates, uh, Pakistan, classic example, the blasphemy laws and so on. Uh, and then very particularly uh, when there's um, a perceived lack of freedom for uh, people to convert to Christianity, particularly from Islam, if, if they choose. And so the uh, the treatment of apostates and so on. So, I mean, that that's sort of front and centre for a lot of evangelicals and uh, I, I did a paper at a Shia college in this country, actually, a few years ago at the al Methi Institute in Birmingham, um, looking at how uh, evangelical Christians view the Sharia in particular uh, through the lens of the treatment of Christians in, in Muslim majority countries. And I think if you, know, if you go into a lot of evangelical churches in this country and say, what do you know about Islam? They would say, oh, they persecute Christians. I mean, sort of like, you know, in... Um, you know, what, what is Sharia? Oh, they don't allow freedom for Christians to worship or to, for conversion and so on. So that's really common. Um, but I mean, the second thing is, uh, I think you're absolutely right that um, there is sort of a problem with, the, you know, liberal democracy. You can do what you say, uh, do, you know, do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. But 
no, you can't, you can't do that. And of course, that that cuts both ways. I mean, we've already talked about how some evangelicals are concerned that uh, laws around Islamophobia or definitions of Islamophobia will shut down free speech, uh, that you won't be allowed to to be critical of Islam. But then, of course, on the other hand, some of those very same Christians would want to introduce the sorts of um, laws and limitations that you've just uh, been talking about, for instance, wearing a niqab or, or so on. Um, I mean, I, again, I think, you know, a lot of evangelicals would uh, absolutely protect those freedoms and they would even be very proud of liberal freedoms for uh, Muslim communities. And they would say, yeah, that's sort of what makes um, Britain a, a country that you'd want to live in because there is exactly that sort of freedom. Um, the third thing I would say, though, is that I think a lot of evangelicals, and this would sort of be on all sides of the spectrum, but I mean, particularly on the uh, more conciliatory, let's call it open um, end of the spectrum, are just very concerned about hypocrisy within uh, Western liberalism. Um, and, you know, just looking at the wealth creation, uh, the inequalities, um, I mean, what happened when when Trump was elected just a few weeks ago with just the huge increase of wealth of the uh, the well, already wealthiest people in the world uh, just because of what happened in stock markets and so on. And I think, you know, there are, there are Christians that look at that and go, that's just not, not right. This is, um, you know, the um, focusing of so much wealth in the hands of so few um, and the way that there just seems to be biased to the rich and, and so on, you know, this this is certainly not the gospel and this is not healthy for society. So um, that would go for uh, evangelicals that criticised the Gulf Wars, for instance, and felt there were double standards um, in the execution of that war and the treatment of Muslim captives in uh, Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, how democracy... Um, is selectively applied in different places. I mean, you can hear evangelicals complaining uh, about that, um, you know, suspension of elections, if a Muslim Brotherhood win elections and all of those sorts of things. So, yeah, I mean, I think you, you bring up a very valid point. And again, it's very uh, diverse responses in the evangelical community, uh, you know, on all sides. But I, I think that's sort of part of just kind of like the crisis that there is in Western liberal dem democratic thoughts at the moment yeah and 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 trying to to kind of find their way um through this and um i wanted to in the in the the time the, in the short time we have left to just briefly explore evangelical understandings of the prophet muhammad um and his you know um how he has been perceived by them. You do cite an historian patriarch who died in 823, um, who said yeah. that Muhammad walked in the path of the prophets. That was that was quite an interesting, I had never read that before. Um, now, clearly, it, many evangelicals would disagree with that and say, you know, um, he, he, you know, he wasn't a prophet and so on and so forth, or he didn't walk in any path of any prophet. Um, Finding that balance, and these these are tricky conversations, but I think they're important to have and to have it in an academic and open way, which is what I love about the book, which is um, how do Christian and Muslims interact with each other when it's, you know, coming coming to something like this? So is Muhammad, who, who, who was the prophet Muhammad for them? Mm -hmm. I mean... And, and then the implications of that can certainly affect the friendship and, and how people communicate and get on with 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 one another, mm -hmm. yeah. especially between evangelicals and, and Muslims, as you point out in the book. Yeah. The entire yeah. I mean, this really goes back to the uh, theological uh, differences we were, we were talking about earlier. So if for evangelicals, uh, sort of the very core of faith uh, is this idea that Jesus Christ is a uh, divine son of God and is in some way uh, unique. Uh, if that's sort of your foundational principle, and then uh, along comes somebody who says, 
something that you perceive to be contrary to that, um, then it's it's then very difficult to say, well, that that person is then speaking in the name of God. I mean, you've sort of just got this, um, you know, uh, th these two things are very, very difficult to equate. Some evangelicals, uh, and again, I mentioned them in the book, do go to very great efforts to say, well, you know, uh, when um, Muhammad or when the Quran says this, and let's put it in those terms, because um, Muslims wouldn't say, well, Muhammad said, I mean, they, the Quran says that Muhammad is just the conduit of, of um, God's revealed word at this point. So um, if the Quran says that um, God is not begotten, nor that does he beget, um, then what, what it actually means there is it's talking about a wrong understanding um, or, you know, um, uh, an, another is counteracting a, an, an erroneous Christian teaching. So this would be the teaching that, or the understanding that that God actually had a physical relationship with Mary, and they physically produced Jesus. You know, it's the Quran is counteracting that, which actually is not a Christian um, belief at all. I mean, that's uh, uh, equally abhorrent to, to Christians as it is to Muslims. There's uh, no question in the in the doctrine of the virgin birth. That there's any sort of physical interaction between God and Mary. I mean, it's the, it's the same story as in the Muslim account that it's it's by the Holy Spirit, it's by God's power, and He comes and overshadows Mary, and so on. Um, so um, there are some evangelicals who would want to say, so in actual fact, the Quran is not um, countering sort of true Christian doctrine; it's countering uh, erroneous understandings of Christian doctrine that could have been around in the seventh century, and, and so on. So there, there are some Christians that in that way just got to try very, very hard to, uh, if you like, uh, exonerate Muhammad from having sort of contradicted um, Christian doctrine. I mean, sort of the problem with this, of course, is that the vast majority of Muslims would say, no, 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 it, that also counteracts um, the orthodox Christian understanding of the sonship of Christ. You know, it's just not acceptable. So it sort of feels then like uh, these evangelicals are trying very hard um, to make some sort of special pleading for Muhammad and, and the Quran in the face of what is actually the majority Muslim opinion. Um, so other uh, evangelicals um, would say, well, look, if, you are, if you're going to insist uh, that I as a Christian call Muhammad a prophet, you're basically asking me uh, to commit, and uh, one author calls it, confessional suicide. Um, and that, that's tantamount to saying to a Muslim, look, if we're going to get on well and have good relationships, you have to acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God. Well, I mean, you know, you're not going to do that. Um, so in actual fact, and, and again, I say this in the book, there are a lot of evangelicals that just try and avoid this conversation, which, I mean, ultimately is, is sort of unhelpful. I think we need to have the conversation, but they're just like, look, okay, no, he's, he's your prophet. He's your man. You know about him. I don't know about him. So I, I'll talk about Jesus um, and sort of try and go around. But, um, I mean, it, it is it's probably the the most difficult um, question that Muslims will ask the Christians is, what do you think of Muhammad? Matter of fact, just last week I was teaching at another sh uh, Shia college here in the UK, down at Islamic College. You know you know those guys um, associated yeah. with the Al-Toy Foundation. And so I was doing a session for them and... Uh, and in actual fact, I've got to go back in a couple of weeks' time and do a session on the Trinity. Um, that's what they've asked me to do. And they, they've got an essay question. So I have to answer some questions on the Trinity. But anyway, in this previous lesson, uh, I said, what what questions would you like me to deal with? And one of the students said exactly this question. Uh, what do Christians think of Muhammad? What do they think of my prophet? Uh, and it's an important question. It, it is certainly an important question. And, and I think that um it's it's i think a lot of growth can occur when discussing these things in a nuanced um and 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 an open way right to kind of appreciating other approaches to other subjects without identifying with that particular group right it's um 
But again, I think a lot of this is made possible, not all of it. I mean, we have so many interactions that have occurred throughout history between Muslims and Christians, as we know very well, um, especially when Christians were a minority within within the Muslim Muslim empire. But I think, again, bringing me back to the point of that the secular nation state is kind of what's allowed these conversations to happen. I mean, these people are meeting one another. It's a kind of grand experiment of what the modern nation state is bringing about. Because um, I, 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 I highly doubt these kinds of conversations would have happened in the way that they're happening now if, if it wasn't for that. Um, it's quite it's quite remarkable. And and I really think again, you know, your book is is it's it's just going to be more relevant than ever. Um, and and yeah. on on that point, I mean, you mentioned Bishop Timothy, this uh, Nestorian bishop, uh, who gives this um, sort of quite guarded answer, really, in as in as much as uh, Muhammad called people to the worship of one true God and to turn away from sin, he walked in the paths of the prophets. Um, you know, I mean, that's sort of quite a diplomatic answer. It's not yeah. saying he was a prophet. He walked in the paths of the prophets. Uh, it is actually acknowledging that we we share uh, the same God, um, which obviously is a big, big question. But I mean, he's also this guy is a courtier in um, the caliph's court. Uh, so possibly a wrong answer could cost him his head. Uh, which is sort of where maybe the the lack of freedom uh, and your point about a civil society or a, a secular society allows this sort of conversation to happen is actually very important. Yes, and 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 I wanted to uh, conclude our discussion today on, well, I think it was one of your one of your later chapters, which is how Muslims became eschatological villains in Israeli Palestinian conflict. Mm. Yeah, um, how evangelicals on the right have thrown all their chips with um, with Israel, essentially, right? I mean, Mike Huckabee is now the ambassador to the to Israel, um, and he, he is a, a very ardent evangelical Christian who says Israel, Palestinians don't exist. They don't exist. There's no such thing as Palestinians, just Judea and Samaria. There's no West Bank. Um, and there's a lot of other people that believe what he believes. Um, how, this is fascinating. I, and, and you do devote an entire chapter to it. Can you shed a little bit of light on, on, on this, this, this issue, which is obviously a live issue right now, but um, and and now we see evangelicals in uh, in America in the highest highest positions of power in the United mm. States. This is mm. this is absolutely incredible. I mean, uh, incredible, mm. or for for some people, scary. I mean, depending where they they are, are on the spectrum here. So, yeah, yeah, uh, I count it as scary personally. I mean, I I think you know we we live in troubling times. Um, so I think the the issues go back to. Firstly, uh, if you read the Bible in, not in depth, but in just in any level at all, uh, you'll see the nation of Israel all over it, uh, particularly the Old Testament. Uh, and God makes certain promises to Abraham and his descendants who are reckoned through Isaac. And so that's the nation of Israel, uh, promises them the land. Um, other Christians will point out that that's a conditional promise. Um, but for a lot of Christians, if you're just going to read it at plain sight, um, the land is promised to Abraham and his descendants. It belongs to Israel. So I mean, that, that's sort of the first point. Second point is that then there's all sorts of prophetic material in the Bible that um, some people would understand to be talking about the future. Uh, it talks about a return to the land. So when the people have gone into exile, now, of course, they went into exile in the Old Testament and then uh, they returned. Uh, possibly twice if you count the return from Egypt uh, the first time around and then the return from Babylon second time around. Um, so when you get this prophetic material uh, talking about the return to the land and the restoration of Israel and so on, uh, the question becomes, well, when is that going to happen? Some, uh, and probably a minority of evangelicals would argue, well, that's already happened. We've seen that already. 
Others would say, no, this is still to happen in the future. And so in actual fact, what happened in 1948 and that, the years before 48, this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. This is very exciting. This is very interesting that um, God is sort of working out his program. And at the end of that program is the return of Jesus, his second, his second coming. Um, and some Christians read prophecy uh, to say all sorts of things about what's going to happen immediately before uh, the second coming of Christ, uh, particularly wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes and so on. Uh, and then particularly this idea of the Battle of Armageddon, uh, when there's some sort of big conflict. And interestingly, if you if you look at what was being written back in the 70s uh, about these times, it was all to do with uh, Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was going to be uh, yeah. sort of this um, uh, invading army coming and, and yeah. attack. Yeah. Um, and then as you go on a few decades, and then it becomes uh, the Soviet Union and uh, Muslim armies, and particularly with after the Iranian Revolution and so on. Uh, and now it's just sort of commonplace um, to, to think that this is actually something more to do with Islam, and you get some very... Um, really sort of quite graphic, um, striking statements about um, you know, what's going to happen in the end times, which are, are just horrendous. Um, now, um, it, then as soon as you look at the what's happening on the ground uh, between uh, Israelis and Palestinians, I mean, it's sort of very easy to paint the Israelis today as being the Israelites of the past. Uh, and then uh, the Palestinians today has been, well, the enemies of the Israelites, and they're equated to the Canaanites and whoever from the Old Testament, who, uh, of course, in that story, uh, were displaced from the land. Um, God is recorded as having said to uh, Joshua and Moses and Joshua and so on to drive the people out of the land. So there are some uh, evangelicals, again, who sort of find um, biblical warrant for what's happening uh, in the current um, situation in Israel and Gaza, they, they sort of make a direct correlation between those Old Testament stories and New Testament stories. There would be other evangelicals that say that's completely unjustified. Um, you can only see it through the lens of Jesus's teaching, and Jesus's teaching is all about love of enemy. Um, it's, it's certainly not to do with genocide um, and destroying your enemy in war. Um, so uh, this is, again, another thing that's causing a real tension between evangelicals on on different ends of the spectrum um personally i mean I, I have a lot of palestinian friends and i'm i'm just very very concerned for them pastorally um when i see what's happening for them uh, on the west bank and uh, in lebanon and so on so my heart really goes out to them yeah it's 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 uh, again and one of the things that i appreciate about your book is is just the breadth of views i don't i mean how you are able to you know, you obviously read widely. You would have had to travel widely, speak to so many different people because you have you provide a breadth of views, right? That look, evangelicalism is not just one thing. There's because today we think evangelical, we think um, you know the likes of you know Mr. Huckabee. That's it. It's kind of that is what it is. But that's obviously, as you point out in the book, not the case. That's that's not necessarily uh, the case. That just that just provides um, you know. Uh, uh, spicy uh, media clips and you know and 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 uh, sound bites, um, and and I guess if there's one thing I would take from this, and then I'll ask you for one thing that you would take, which is uh, this, uh, at least at least what I hope to get out of your book and and discussing with my colleagues. I have a lot of Christian colleagues that I work with here at the University of Toronto. Um, and at other institutions as well, is is a lot of growth can come out of dialogue and discussion. And um, people can agree to disagree without without having animosity. They can they can they can appreciate the intellectual acumen and spirituality of one another um, without disagreeing, um, even if they be evangelicals. And that's what I found was just to conclude particularly astonishing because when we think evangelical, you know, we probably think of its equivalent on the Muslim side, which might be some kind of far right-wing extremist Salafi 
uh, you know, movement, which is a kind of zero sum game, but that's just not the case. Mm. Um, so that's at least my kind of simple takeaway. Yeah. It's both academic, but I think it's also instructive on how we can really have a meaningful civil dialogue on these issues. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's very heartening. That's what I, I would hope you would take away. Uh, evangelicals are incredibly diverse. And I mean, just as some evangelicals would say, well, true Muslims are those Muslims who are those very extreme, um, violent groups. Um, just in that, in the way that that's not true, that Muslims are, are much, much broader and more diverse than that. Uh, when outsiders look in and say, well, evangelicals are those fundamentalist right wing extreme. Well, no, that's that's equally not true. Um, both communities are, are very broad and diverse. And I mean, I think my added uh, hope for the book would it would actually encourage evangelicals to talk together. Um, so this idea of a public sphere, uh, and I, I sort of talk about this in the conclusion, is uh, is our evangelical public sphere robust enough to actually hold um, the sort of the ferocity of the of the debate and the discourse uh, across this spectrum, because uh, I think we do need to keep talking. I mean, so, some people has, have suggested that evangelicalism just does split in uh, into two. Uh, I think of the work of um, Ashley Kwosik and um, her, her colleague, I can't remember his name. Um, but if, if that's not to happen, then there has to be a, a, a better engagement and dialogue between evangelicals. Uh, and we need sort of uh, fora and uh, media that can actually facilitate that. Um, and, you know, whether that's uh, meetings, conferences, writing, uh, online uh, chat or whatever, it's, it's not easy to have those conversations, but they need to go on between evangelicals as well as between evangelicals and Muslims as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. McCallum. Um, okay. Thank you to our viewers for joining us listening this far to the end, visit our website, social media, or our YouTube channel for more content. If you enjoyed today's conversation, um, think about contributing to the Shia Research Institute to help drive more quality content. And we hope you will join us uh, for future episodes. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. McCallum, again for joining us. Thank you.